This episode of Hello Monday is brought to you by Delta. Delta flies to 300 cities. That's 300 cities where people sing in the car, poorly. 300 cities where people miss someone in one of the other 299 cities. And Delta isn't flying to those 300 cities merely to bring us together, but to show us we're not that far apart in the first place. Delta, keep climbing. From the editorial team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday, a show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. For the next two weeks, I'm going to try something a little different. I want to share with you two of my favorite episodes of a show called This Is Working. It's a show hosted by LinkedIn's editor-in-chief, Dan Roth. He's a colleague of mine and also a friend. Dan and I have actually known each other much of our careers. We worked at Fortune together a long time ago. Dan's really great at getting to what matters in a conversation. I'm sure you'll hear it right away. Since the Oscars are coming up next week, I'm starting with his interview with Patty Jenkins. Patty's the most successful female director in Hollywood. Full stop. Her credits include Wonder Woman. The sequel comes out later this year. Patty negotiated a record salary for that sequel. When she talks about asking for money, I sit up a little straighter. She plays hardball, and it's not just for her own bank account. Patty's outspoken about the way that women are treated in Hollywood, and she feels a lot of responsibility to ask for more so that women coming after her can do the same. There's a lot to learn from Patty's approach. Here's Patty Jenkins in conversation with Dan Roth. One of the things that you've talked about openly is is how much weight you put on yourself to yeah. in the decisions that you make and how ne- you negotiate for your paycheck, that, the dis- that what you're doing will have a ripple beyond just you and your family, that you are doing things that might set precedent for other women in Hollywood. Yeah. Would you talk about that? Sure. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting thing to find yourself in this position. There has been, there's obviously a huge pay disparity in it, and there's been, a, you know, a disparity of success in across the board. And we're all becoming more aware of that. I was never so aware of it years ago, but now I really uh, see it. And there are a couple of things in place that keep that as it is. In Hollywood, the, the thing that has been keeping it that way, there's a, there is something that we call a, um, uh, the quote system, which makes sense if if you are someone who's been hired for X amount of money and now you're being hired, you're you know another time you can either ask for a small raise or whatever. Subsequently, you get you you move your way up. However, always when people have big successes, it breaks the rules of that. They go from being on a soap opera to being a movie star. It breaks those rules. One of the places where it really fails is when it it's it's holding women to build up their quote system the same way men do because women have had a harder time getting their movies made. And so it means that if you direct a lot less often, you're never getting that chance to build your 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 rate up. I did take it very seriously to say, I, we could talk about those things all day long, but at the end of the day, I don't care. I wanna be being paid a parallel to the men who are directing blockbusters of this type. And the only way that we ever get here is by saying that that's absolutely necessary for, for, for me to make a stand. And so I was very lucky that I got supported to do that, but it's never pleasant. You know, everybody has talked about how women are looked down upon for asking for money. And it's seen in a much more uh, unflattering light. And that's a bummer, you know, but because there really was a period of time that that negotiation was going on. And I was hearing about it talked about in the public I, where you do hear a lot of the the descriptives around it. And you're like, yeah, this is this is how it happens. This is how it happens. If I was a guy and I was playing hardball, it would be totally different. But as a woman playing hardball, it was treated a little differently. So I've seen it happen with other friends of mine who were women who'd had to go through the same thing. And you just have to muscle through it. It was it was it was made much easier because I believed in the, its importance. But you're talking about the negotiation for, yeah. Wonder, for the Wonder yeah. Woman sequel. Yeah, if not me, who right. says I, I want to be getting paid the exact same as the men who are directing parallel successes. But typically in a negotiation, you get to go in and just represent yourself. What am I, what do I need to be successful? Now you have to go in and say, what do yeah. I do that will actually talk to other women and put other women on this path? Sometimes, or at least not all women, but many women's whole careers are that way. Who was it I was just listening to uh, the in the Ruth Bader Ginsburg documentary where she was talking about, I, could, I had to be excellent because if I dropped the ball, it was speaking for all women. I couldn't relate more. There was, you know, there have been other projects that I courted 
and talked about doing, and they worked out to be perfectly good projects, but I knew that they weren't going to be good enough, and that if they, that they were, I was going to be taking a step back for my entire gender. If I did it and it didn't work out, it was gonna be a huge blow for everybody. I have to, I have to be uh, representing that at the same time as I'm thinking about my career. Do you get to a point where you no longer have to think that way? Hopefully. I mean, I'm, only, I'm almost hoping that I'm there now just because I hope that things are changing and you know, you're gonna make all different kinds of things. When you're doing firsts, that's when it's like, oh God, <laughs> you're, you're representing a lot. Yeah, so are you looking out to see other examples of when you feel like you've crossed over and it's no longer about first, that you're like, all right, this is standard now. Women get paid enough and we don't have to go in and ask for, when we do dodgy movies, it reflects just badly on us. It doesn't reflect yeah. on the entire gender. We're not there yet, but I'm hoping that it's right around the corner. Yeah. And certainly there are women who have gotten to great power in their careers. You know, Oprah Winfrey, J.K. Rowling. There are people who have become incredibly established in their success, and it's no longer a question. They are successful and powerful people. I think that's wonderful. I think, you know, I talk to a lot of business leaders. I never ask men these questions. Yeah. This is never comes up like, oh, you made a bad decision with your company. Don't you think that reflects badly on men also? Are you? Amazing. Are, yeah, are you sick of hearing these questions? I mean, does this the kind of no, thing you're I, like, enough? I have, I have complex thoughts about it because I had grown up watching lots of films by all kinds of women and men and all kinds of international. Living in New York, what you watch is very uh, uh, universal. And even before I lived here, you're seeing indie films and small films. So I was surprised where we were in the world when I realized this was such an issue, women directors and, you know, different kinds of stories. Yes, it's a bummer that it so defines one's career, but I'm also aware that it has to be talked about. So therefore, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to talk about it. I don't want to stick my head in the sand. It's, right. it's a real issue. Could you talk a little bit about your work ethic? I've seen people talk about you on set. You're there before everyone else is. You're there after they leave. Oh, that's nice. Uh, um, it's nice to hear. How do you describe I, yourself as a, as a manager do, or director? I, it's not that I consider myself an extremely hard worker. I do believe in the uh, discipline of working hard. So I am trying to always give absolutely everything I have to something. I'm probably that way anyway, and I probably, my father was a fighter pilot and very that way as well. And so I, I probably come from, from that training, even in, as, as a child. But as I, I hearken back to the, when I was a PA, which is production assistant in film, right out of college in 94, I ended up getting a chance to meet a camera crew who did very high-end commercials. And they were very skeptical of me and they said, sure, you can work for us if you're gonna work for free for six months and you have to memorize absolutely everything about cameras. You have to be here three hours early, you have to take part of a lens, wanna know the flange focal distance of every camera. And so I came into this industry thinking, wow, that's the way it goes. So I'm so grateful now to that training because for the first nine years of my career working as a camera person, I thought that's how it had to be done. You cannot fail, it has to be tack on. I have carried that over to my directing career where it's like gotta be there before call, an hour before call at least and so that you can see what's happening and you have to be prepared and all of those things. Um, you know, definitely there are a lot of directors I deeply admire who do it totally differently. You know, that that's their way of, that's their style. This is my style, is that I, I sort of believe in that kind of approach. And do you expect the people you work with to have that same approach? Not as extremely, I feel like. Certainly when you're working, like we just did a 123 day shoot, everybody doesn't have to be there an hour early. I'm the director. I'm the person who's responsible for having answers for everything that happens that day. And I'm the person who could stop the ship if I don't like that rug. Right. So for me, I put that on myself because I don't want to be wasting time once we start shooting because I just got here and I just realized I hate that rug, mm -hmm. you know? So that's my own, but you know, my crew is working very long hours and long days. They, they don't have to do that. But I do expect, yes, I do expect seriousness about work. I'm not great when people are, you know, uh, went out drinking all night long and aren't prepped or something. That would definitely be unacceptable for me. So they show up, they think it's totally fine. You're going to joke around with them. And you're that like, would, that definitely would rub me the wrong way. Right. <laughs> I've been lucky to get to work with a lot of great professionals. Do you like to uh, take people under your wing? Do you like to, to in, do you like to have interns? Do you, how do you make sure that people are, are learning beside you? Are you 
doing it hands-on, or are you just expecting them to watch and see how you operate? I think it's a little of everything. I feel like all of my assistants are all young filmmakers often. There are people who are smart and capable, and I and I and they're probably the people that I, there are people like that on the set that I train the most, and I have a few associate producers who I work with in that way. Um, yeah, I try to. I probably don't do a good enough job, but I, de I definitely care about everybody having a good time and, you know, or a, a, a healthy and productive and safe time. It's not always a good time. <laughs> it's, it's often hard work. Yeah. It rains and right. it's cold. And yeah. you have, you, you're, you have a, you're back in TV. You're doing yeah. uh, um, a few episodes of I Am The Night. Yes. And since you last have done TV, the world of episodic um, storytelling has changed with Hulu and Netflix entering and playing a much bigger role. Yeah. Have you noticed the difference? Big time. Yeah. It was interesting. When I made Monster and it was successful, I... It was such an intense experience making that film. And I have always worked. When I was a camera person, I worked all the time. So I remember immediately facing that whatever my next film was going to be was my next film. And I wanted to pick the right one and I wanted to write the right one, but I also wanted to work in the meantime because I believe in kind of working on spec a lot of the time. So I didn't want to go um, to, to choosing a feature uh, for money. So. I made a concerted effort to go into television, and it was unusual then to be working in that direction. Everybody was very taken aback and kind of like, why would you want to do TV? And I was saying, because I want to work and because I like to learn at the same time. So I went immediately and did Arrested Development. I loved the show. It was my favorite show. And it was great. It was shooting in a different style. I had come up around a lot of comedy, so it was nice to jump in into that after doing something so dark. Um, and then I started moving on to doing pilots, and that's more akin to doing a feature because a lot of people don't know what a pilot director does. A pilot director takes a script and turns it into a show. So you're you're looking at just pages, and then you cast it, and you build the sets, and you build everything. And so, and then you may not stay, but it's still that's it's a very attractive um, pursuit for for a director. Um, and gradually over those years, more and more people started to cross back and forth and do both. And now it's becoming much more fluid, but it's, there's still something interesting about it. Like there's something funny about like what, what counts and what doesn't. I think we're just now starting to get to the place where it's like, I don't see the difference that much. I did this as a limited series because it was the right way to tell this story. And I do a feature because a, the way to see it is on the is on the screen in a massive audience, you know? You do things for it, the right place. But when you did Arrested Development, when yeah. you went and started doing TV, instead of following the traditional feature path, was there any part of you that worried that maybe you were taking yourself out of the running for films in the future? Kind of. You, I worry, you worry about everything. However, um, I do consider myself a writer-director, and so I don't want to just do every feature. And the, those, I didn't have a feature that came to my desk that I wanted to do, but yet there were many that I wanted to write. And I don't believe in development process a lot of the time. So, um, so it, what, is, what does that so mean? So development process is I go and I pitch a studio. Right. I want to write this thing, pay me X amount of money to write it. Right. They say yes. I was hot off the heels of Monster. A lot of people were going to say yes. And but then you start to make the movie with that person and they start giving you notes and you t it turns out that you aren't creatively in sync at all. And now they own the project. As a writer director, that's a lot of power for very little, uh, it's, it's a lot of money, but it's like you own now everything that I'm doing basically. So for me, I just thought for features, let me just write them on my own and then you'll know whether you are on the same page. Then we'll have something we're talking so about. So do you counsel people out of doing the development process? Uh, I would, if particularly if it was someone new, I would, I would, because I think like give the things that you do the very best chance to succeed, and the very best chance of succeed is keep it whole and un, un, undiluted as long as possible, because then you can really find the right partners. Yeah. This show, I Am the Night, we wrote almost all the scripts before we ever sold it. It was what it was. And when we were able to go out with it, we were able to say, this is it. And this is when we want to shoot it. And this is how it is. So anyway, it's just something that I believe in. And nowadays, I actually am a stat. I know enough people in the place that I'm working that I that it's different. I would develop something with Warner Brothers. I know Warner Brothers very well. We would have a shorthand 
and and many of the other places in town too. I like know people and you know what you're dealing with. So it, it does change over time. Right, and you're in a much better negotiating position yeah. to say exactly what that development deal would look like. Yeah, exactly. Um, Hulu and Netflix, other streamers, they are certainly changing um, how we get our entertainment and what we expect from entertainment. Does it have a, has it made any difference in how you think about your career or directing when you know you're not, for at least TV, you're not trapped into seg- uh, episodes of a certain amount of time or a season of a certain amount of episodes? Is it I changing haven't. how you think at all? Yeah, it's definitely, it's changed a number of things. It's changed the marketplace in that all kinds of different things are being made and that's wonderful. There was a chunk of time from when I when I first got into the industry and now where it was like the indie film died and there was no other outlet for it. So if you wanted to do anything but a tent pole, there was nowhere to go. That was I knew that wasn't going to last because we've been telling, you know, those kinds of stories for uh, forever of why would we stop now? I knew somebody was going to figure out where to put them out and how. What I think is exciting about it is now there are all of these different sliding scales of like where you could make things for what. I think that's exciting. However, I also do not at all subscribe that it's a one or the other. When when a lot of people are talking about streaming, they're saying like, oh, it's the death of the studios. I don't believe that at all. I think the studios may need to downsize. They may have gotten too big, but, um, but you know, when television was in, came around in the first place, they said people would stop going to the theaters. That's not why we go to the theaters. We don't go to the theaters because there's no other place to get a story told to you. We've had books and all kinds of things. There's many ways. We go to the theaters because we like a theater experience and we want to go out to the movies. You want to go on a date or you want to go somewhere with your friends. It's a special and unique thing that I truly believe in and I hope it always stays and I believe it will always stay. So more outlets for amazing content is only a good thing, in my opinion. What kind of career advice do you give people? There must be people coming to you all the time saying, how do I get into Hollywood? Should I follow your path? What do you tell young people in particular who want to get in? My husband uh, told me a great analogy. I can't remember where he got it, that it's like that, that Hollywood or success in this industry in particular is like a brick wall and like holes will pop through and then they close back up. Mm-hmm. And so you have to find your own hole. I think that it's literally perseverance and passion, but perseverance first and foremost. I've, I've, I have passed in on in the d- journey to get to being a director. Um, so many people who were very talented, right. extremely talented, who who d- changed their mind or didn't want to do it or didn't want to or you know gave up or any number of things. And I feel like. The ones that I have watched who have made it, a lot of us have just kept trying and been tenacious about continuing to try. So I think it's like looking for any opening. My opening was so unusual and so many of them are. You know, I got through a B-movie backdoor where nobody was interested in me or my career or what I wanted to do, but I... um, but they were making straight to video serial killer movies and I happened to be a true crime buff. And so I said something super low stakes, let me make a movie about Eileen Warners for you. And they said, sure, fine, whatever. And then we ended up not being able to make a deal, but now I was already making it. It was an easy movie to get made, super easy, because they didn't, it was gonna sell to straight to video, so what difference does it make? And so it was a weird backdoor that then I was able to parlay that into expanding it into the film I truly wanted to make and make it something I was passionate about. But you never know. So you never know. Any any of those things can work. You're offering very different advice at the beginning of your career than you suggest in the sort of middle or as you reach success, which is- How so? That's interesting. Well, you talked a little bit about the idea of holding on, for instance, with no development deals. The idea right. that you need to hold on to everything you've got. You, you only pitch, you only go out True. with what you feel like is your strongest. When, when you're starting, you're looking for any kind of opening yes, that you think is out there. Yes, but it's still any kind of opening that you can do a great job uh-huh. at. You know, and so th- always my, advi- my advice is in all cases, being playing defense to thinking that you can parlay this, always eyes on the prize to a great film, you know? And so I w- that was the B-movie door that opened, but there were many other doors. I think uh, it's all about trying to make films that you believe in and looking for any door to do it. The door that I found that I believed in the most was keeping control. That was hard too, you know? So it's always about do- whatever suffering it takes. 
<laughs> to, to protect your film. Got it. And you had also done, you talked about being, working for free. You were an intern, you were, you were willing to work for free to be able to get that first, very first foot in the door. Is yep. that something you recommend? Yes. Yeah, put definitely. yourself out there, just say whatever. Yeah, definitely. I will, I will show up and you don't have to pay me to do this. Yes, and by the way, I don't come from a, a privileged background either, so I was waiting tables at the same time. So I'm not, it's not advice I give that's, uh, that is, is saying that you have to be able to afford to not work. You, finding a way to offer yourself for the time. So I took weekend shifts because those commercials and music videos were happening during the week. And then I would only take the ones that I could do and just only work super hard on the weekend. So it's like whatever you whatever you can do to to find a way to get the training. And it definitely helped. My my assistant before this, he came up to me and dedicated he at I was speaking at his college, Loyola Marymount, and he said, I want to work for you. I had just had a baby and said, I don't need it. And he said, I'm going to work for you for free. I was like, I really don't. He was like, I'm going to. <laughs> he was with me for eight years. Wow. And now he co-produced the show. So it's like, it's, it's, it, it, it's getting that training and getting, your, getting what you need in whatever way you need to. That's great. Well, Patty, thank you so much for joining us here today. That was terrific. Thank you. So nice to meet you.